Thank you all for joining us. I'm Carly Lemon with Underwood CD. We are lucky to have Chan with us, the um, engineering geologist with Natural System Design, to talk to us about engineering log jam, how to model them, how to work with them, and all that you take away, Chan. Okay. Thanks so much. Guys, thank you guys. Julie, 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 using the unanchored wood or loose wood because there's been a lot of interest in that and as you all probably know that I mean, there's such a huge spectrum of wood it's, it's you can't too much lumping you have to really get when, when the context is what is that uh goals of a project uh so i'll go into some of the, uh a little bit of the theory a little just a little very Quick little primer just about some wood and um, and then then we'll get into that guidance and I've got copies of it I could leave with you that are on that that thumb drive uh, so we have a you know a spreadsheet tool as well as a, a document for that uh, and uh, this is actually a piece of loose wood that's very stable in the um, in the upper Carbon River is a post right. Here and give you a little bit of scale. Uh, and it's completely full of with sediment. So it's got very little drag force on it. Um, but uh, you can see it uh, impounding this section of the channel. There are other channels in the river. Uh, so it's not creating a, a barrier in this period. Uh, so um, after I get through the, the beginning part of just talking about some wood stuff. We'll talk about this uh, unanchored feasibility pool, and then we'll just go through some basics and uh, think about modeling um, and uh, touch on a few things just that you, you covered in your, your, your talk, too. Uh, so, some basic facts, you know, I always find here interesting and I just look at has been around and ripping strains for. Hundred million years um, ever since trees showed up on it. Um, and it's been reported in the GOI uh, record for that. Um, there's no one really even knows how many trees there really are to species wise. Uh, Liz has done a good job, of course, in the that. But some estimates put it at about 90,000. Uh, of course, wood has been hugely important for human civilization. Um, you could even say human evolution, and um, uh, and that's driven a lot of uh, uh, changes on the planet that that affect the work we do too in our streets and uh, the changes in wood building. Uh, and then another thing to keep in mind too, in, in, in many systems, you know, your wood, your stream is getting sediment, and, and part of that sediment load is the wood. And it tends to be one of the largest class entering, but of course it's unique with its density and shape. And then, um, and wood longevity, uh, wood certainly is subject to decay, but in the right environment, it can last a long, long time. This is actually just on the other side of the ridge here in the uh, Chinaway, there's a, a, a little petrified log uh, exposed in that uh, bedrock. Uh, this is a very long time we'll come back to in another uh, uh, or later in the talk. So, um, as you all know, wood creates a lot of distinct uh, features in rivers, um, from cover for adults um, to cover for juveniles um, to mammals, bats, birds, all sorts of uh, creatures can uh, utilize that log jam. Um, and then all the habitat it's created uh, associated with it. And then this is a, a, a nice picture we did a, where we had some log jams and a, it was a plain red boulder reach. And then uh, 
that after the launch, he was going to create a couple nice pools outside of Eatonville, and then it became a really popular place for uh, summertime swimming. And uh, they, local locals would even use the piles to post posters for parties or, or <laughs> music events. Um, and so, um, so again, we'll, you know, key is wood adds roughness to, and that's going to be a big theme in general is that that roughness it adds to channels, and that can then have a lot of effect on the physical process you can. Um, like Doss been talking about with uh, sediment conveyance, sediment transport capacity. Um, generally, when you add wood, um, grains, here's a grain size distribution that we talked about earlier. Um, and with when we add, we put in log channel, and this, this is the LWA, you can see a major decrease in grain size um, that resulted once uh, this kind of field of ELJs had gone in. Um, they tend to create uh, more anabranching, sometimes you'll hear an anastomosing, but more complex systems. Um, and they, it can make things like bankfold more complicated too, because the wood is affecting water bubbles. Um, and, uh, and one thing, when you're out in, in the environments, if you see kind of multiple floodplain surfaces, it may be a, it may be a clue that there was in, uh, a wood dominated system at one point, or it may still be. Uh, and uh, because it's again, well, some of the, the channels will, will move, and the effect of the wood will either increase or decrease um, over time. So, this is um, one of my colleagues went out in, uh, at UW and uh, do my graduate work. Um, so John Buffett's work. John has done a lot of great work on uh, sediment transport and, and wood. This is just a couple of his figures um, uh, that really kind of sum up things. You know, where you have more wood, you have more topographic or bathymetric complexity. You have a lot more grain size variation. These are patches of different grain sizes, and then a system without much wood is just a much simpler system. Uh, and again, just the scale of things would can affect uh, things at, at even the microscopic level um, of your invertebrates and all the uh, uh, conditions that go on when you start to create these very these porous uh, mediums, um, especially when you have big accumulations of wood, um, to then affecting bed forms and then uh, and then, in some cases, affecting the plant form of your flippers. Um, usually, I do this one without giving any answers, but um, another, another theme is we've changed the, the tree and riparian populations of our rivers. Um, and there used to be a lot more big trees, just like there used to be a lot more big fish to catch. Uh, and, um, and this, this is uh, one that usually has suffered. This is an American sycamore back in Indiana, um, and they were real prominent uh, source of snags and wood in the Mississippi and Missouri system, uh, and all cypress. So very, um, the, that change has affected what's going on in the rivers. I'll talk a little bit more. Um, again, a couple more examples. Some of the big pond roasts here, Bend, Oregon, um, a big red cedar, in Willapa, there was actually a red cedar. We have a 1906 account from the lower Elwha um, from a government survey that was 27 feet in diameter, which is just a couple of feet shy of uh, giants, the, the, the general trunk of giants in Um uh, So big, most of our big trees are gone. Um, here was when I some of my old field work. It's just an example of a recently recruited citrus spruce in the Queens River. Uh, so uh, one thing that we have found out too in the last few decades, and there were some examples I uh, have, you know, I have an old map made by an army surveyor back in the 1800s who recognized that wooded banks or forested banks erode more slowly than uh, unforested banks. 
And we have more data on that. And so there's a couple of publications. This one, they looked at the Sacramento and here's the migration rate over time. And there's two, these two different populations. Um, well, yeah. There's, there's the riparian channels and then agriculture. And you could just see the uh, the forested migrations are about half of what they are. And some work I did with, uh, which shows a similar kind of thing. And this was in a, uh, along the Queen section, the west side of the peninsula. Uh, so here is the riparian forest structure. So basically, young, with, which is treated less than 21 inches in diameter. Full uh, 21 inches and greater, which uh, again is still relatively young for the tree side of trees over there. Um, but and then normalized erosion rate, you can see about less than half the um, uh, rate of erosion where you have the, uh, the larger trees. And uh, there's been other work out of the Midwest that's come up with similar kind of relationships. Um, and you know, it's not just the root cohesion because on some like these, some of these big rivers, the the root depth is well above your phthalate. So something else is going on to, to cause that slow erosion. Uh, um, those of you uh, probably uh, somewhat familiar, but I can and I can send you there's a lot of some publications of a lot of the topics I'll talk about um, about the large wood cycle, which summed up basically is that when you have big trees in a, uh, a river valley that are recruited to the channel, they can create these hard points that then structure the river, but also create a refugia for trees to grow to old age and produce a, a new source of large wood. Um, so what, what we've seen in some rivers, like the work we've done on the upper Quinal with other rivers is um, the loss of those big trees has resulted in a loss of the hard points and then more rapid channel migration, uh, which then makes it kind of sets up a cycle where it's harder and harder to have the old trees uh, reestablished. Okay, so as I kind of alluded to, that their size and shape of wood is really important. And this is going to be super important when you're talking about creating loose wood in a river. Uh, and uh, so you, you could start with just basics of looking at, um, and again, I've got some publications as well as uh, uh, there's, the, I'll refer to, you put a bunch of this into the National Wood Handle. Uh, but you could start with just real simple cylinder and looking at uh, uh, how that becomes buoyant. Uh, so if you just had a cut log, the most buoyant shape is actually that stump because you're getting a lot of displacement rapidly with depth. Um, so there's been, I think, in our industry that there's some confusion or um, not to be sure how to describe, but with robots, like why are you using robots? So hopefully this will, will create some more clarity. Um, and why you can use food by because they're they are more expensive and more destructive to get robots if you're sourcing them. So it's like, well, let's make sure we're using them in, a, in a, uh, uh, the most efficient way. Uh, so one thing a robot does actually is it elevates the same mass of your tree. So that means it's going to take a lot more water depth to submerge that before it can become mobile. So um, so that's a big factor there, where, where so, you know, we just had a, the same log that was cut off. Uh, it's going to go buoyant a lot sooner than when it has this, uh, this root line picking up the, the center mass. And you can go through and figure out the center mass and volume. And I've got some spreadsheets too that have been to do this for you all if you're interested. But the other thing it does is it changes the uh, some of the statics of your, you know, your, your basically your normal course, you're creating a smaller area where you've got a large weight of a uh, tree pressed down into your channel. Um, so it's, it's, that's creating more resistance, um, to drag. And then it also creates a close separation, which I'll talk about in the next figure here, 
where sediment can start to accumulate. And then that really starts to change the, the force balance of your, your system. So again, and then you've got, you know, different species. It's not just cut logs versus wood logs, but the taper of a tree can affect uh, all this. Um, this was just some experiments I did when we had a skitter out on a site and we dried and looked at what, you know, the initial force uh, for related or recipient emotion of the log was. And then this is the, the plow length is basically this uh, depth below the, the, your bowl of your log. Um, and, and the log length, and just you can see this is log, log plot, but it's taking a greater, um, the more that plow length uh, increases, the, the more of a, a forged is to initiate movement of the wood. So then, as I was saying, that it, when you create a, this is, a blue wad also creates a blood body. And blue wads usually, but not always, but usually go up, going upstream. And you could think of a block by a raindrop is the same thing. A raindrop is coming with its big end into the flow, essentially, the airflow. Um, and so this will be the more stable configuration. Uh, the block lights have that, that root wide upstream. Um, and, when it, and then it starts to create this flow separation envelope where sediment can start to accumulate. Um, it's obviously really important for fish too. Uh, by creating this uh, place uh, an eddy for the fish. And often they love hanging out right at that, that flow split. Uh, so that, um, again, then you can, you know, there's looking at the hydraulics and now with uh, the prevalence of 2D modeling, you can start to do this. And in the latest tech class, there's even a, a tool for putting in a um, 3D, well, well, 2D, um, uh, move on lock into the, 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 your mesh. Uh, so once it starts to dig itself in to the bed, that's when they become remarkably stable. Um, so one of the key questions is, will it dig itself in? So obviously, if you're, if you're just putting it in on bedrock, that's going to be unlikely. Uh, and, uh, you know, unless, again, unless you can show that it's going to still be stable and then trap sediment behind it. Uh, so knowing whether it's going to dig in is going to be another big factor for, uh, hey, how comfortable are you just putting in these pieces? Uh, this is the plot here of uh, the sediment depth leeward or downstream of that root wad, and then the force, um, the blue is the drag force, so just this is what you're looking from flow. And you can see that that resisting force, you can predict when it would, when it crosses and you start to get more stable in this particular case. Um, we've got about a one meter uh, depth of sediment when it starts to cross that. That and your force balance is where you've got your resisting force is greater than your um, uh, drag forces. Uh, one thing we're doing a lot more with ELJ or engineering structures is uh, using a pot, using piles of boats. Uh, we typically call a cut pile, if we were just refer to as a pile, we'll sometimes refer to this kind of uh, situation as a post because if you're going to put in a root by you, you're typically going to have to dig that in versus this you could drive in depending on the geographical conditions. And but one thing again, once that root line is uh, you have something like a root line buried that the, the resisting forces increase really dramatically compared to the regular pile, which is really relying only on skin ratio. Uh, so then if that, in some cases, if you've got even, uh, we were using them at angles, um, uh, both, well, both, both types of, uh, piles of posts. Um, uh, so the same principles are going to apply when, uh, so again, these are reasons why you might want to use a, a root by, uh, uh, Here's just again pull out strength, you know, what it takes to pull something out of the ground. Um, 
with uh, so here's the very depth of the total length um, extraction force over the weight of it um, to try to normalize each axis and then no blood and with the blood. So you're getting a lot more resistance um, when you add that. So these are kind of physical reasons to use a blood. You know, the biologic reasons to use a blood might be because it's got a, a lot of complexity, but I would argue that. You can, you can do that much more effectively with uh, small wood integrated into your project. Um, so there is this document, I can get you a text on our website too, that it's got, uh, it's a nice big, nice back government <laughs> publications on, uh, on a wide range of topics, but there is a chapter on engineering and geomorphology in there that uh, 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 has a lot of good information. And then just briefly touching on wood longevity. Uh, again, I love this quote. This is St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice, Italy. Um, the piles underneath the cathedral there are, are over, were over a thousand. This was written in 41. So in 41, they were over a thousand years old and in near perfect condition because they were in an anaerobic environment. So, um, so wood under the right conditions can last a lot of time. This was a, a, a simple model I put together of just based on a uniform rate of decay on into wood and using decay coefficients of wood just sitting on a porous floor. Uh, and then give this, these are two different uh, sets of curves. Uh, so this is mass at your time, time t mass, when you get that your initial mass of your stroke of your of your wood or your log. And this is uh, cottonwood curves. This would be uh, cedar curves. Much, you know, so wood that's a uh, uh, decays much slower rate than the uh, this axis is just based on this simple model. You can estimate how what the effective diameter of your, your wood would be after a certain time. <laughs> um, just exposed. This is the log jam over at least 120 years old on the South Fork exact that was exposed by bank erosion. Uh, here's one that's uh, uh, almost a thousand years old. I mean, here's some of the, the, the dates about 600 to almost 1200 years old, very log jam, and also associated with a higher surface uh, in that Queens River. And we're slowly doing it since the cost of carbon dating is, is gotten better um, over the last decades. We're just sort of doing trying to integrate that into some of our projects. Um, and so I can send you all more information on this, but just examples of some of the uh, ages that so wood wood can last a long time. Um, and but it's important to know that context, um, uh, how much you're counting on this. One site, again, it was a stream and sizing at a cross, a washout crossing, um, exposed a layer of, of uh, organic material, including wood that was over 45,000 years old. Okay, so real briefly, removing wood can have big consequences, channel simplification, but the most insidious one is, is uh, incision. Uh, this is an urban prefilter in uh, Bellevue area. And um, it, it, this is a combination of both urbanization, increased peak flow, and wood removal, um, creating that head cut. Uh, so uh, this is a system where there was no urbanization whatsoever on the shell of uh, just wood removal. And you can see clap ridge here, exposure of bedrock. So, uh, and once you start getting, letting things get that bad, a lot more expensive to put it back together. Um, the other big thing is, uh, um, again, you also mentioned too, the bonus the stream we get. Um, and that's a real common result of, uh, of the lava loss of the ocean. Okay, and then I'll just touch on, and this is some work I've been recently doing, and uh, uh, did a presentation at AGU last in December, but. Uh, this is looking at how wood basically partitions roughness and the consequences to fish. Um, 
And so this is a range of uh, red burial beds. This y axis is, is scour depth. And you can see under existing conditions, um, this is increasing discharge on the active. You can see that it's uh, under existing conditions, it's scouring uh, well with. It's basically there's very low would be low survival of eggs in this in this particular river with uh, under existing conditions, and then these curves are just uh, progressively more wood accounting for more stress partition. So ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent, forty percent. So you're basically reducing your scour depth and a reach average with when you're adding wood. And then this is just some results from some hydraulic modeling where we integrated uh, some of this uh, the scour effect. So this is the green would be that hypothetical with wood put back again scour depth. Uh, this is discharge and scour depth. Uh, and again, the range the shaded areas, the range of uh, uh, typical range of red depths. And then you can see in this particular system. Where there's not much, uh, it, where GFW has not documented very many reds, and there's good reason for it because there's so much scour. This this is uh, on the Hogo, which actually the stream bed has some really nice gravel, but it's just every year it's getting scoured uh, significantly because of lack of roughness. And then this is using some of John Buffett's data. Um, again, estimated scour and this is just progressive amounts of wood. And then this was a new wood density function. I derived this uh, recently on, uh, so we can start to say, well, how much, you know, have some visible criteria for how much wood do you want to put in using this as kind of a criteria of, so again, range of, uh, uh, typical range of, this is law of scale, typical range of red depths. Um, and you can see when you get, uh, the, Use this wood function of maybe significantly decrease your uh, scour depth. So that's hopefully kind of a cool tantalizing thing. And uh, if any of you are interested, you definitely can uh, hold me and I can uh, talk to you more about that. Uh, so here we'll get into the finally get into the unanchored wood part of this. Uh, so we've got this, this is from uh, our little. Uh, Report to the Yakima Nation. Uh, so we've got on the here stream power and relative cost on the x axis, um, risk here, um, uh, and engineering complexity on the y axis, uh, increasing this way. Uh, and then grain size decreasing um, and size of available wood. There. So in this corner, we've got loose pieces uh, that are, you know, not not key piece size. The key piece would be it's usually referring qualitatively to a piece that's likely to to, to stabilize by itself in a uh, a river, or at least move very slowly down the river. Uh, key pieces, and then just basically all the way up to to a, a very engineered structure. Uh, so again, more powerful rivers, more uh, engineering complexity, more cost to construct. Um, so, like I said, we can. Uh, I'll leave this uh, document with uh, Harley and uh, uh, and uh, along with the uh, the spreadsheet. So, um, so again, it goes into like, well, what are your your goals? So, what do you what do you that with all of this reason that's always the most important thing to grill yourself on or, or grill whoever you're reviewing or working with um to, to and then be really be able to go back to those every step of the design should relate back to those, those goals uh you know are you just trying to increase some cool frequency are you trying to reduce grain size that we've talked about um and then you know, for unanchored wood, it's intended to remain where you put it. Um, if it's expected to move, is it going to collect somewhere downstream? And why? Why do you think? You know, what would make it? Uh, you think it's going to? And then, uh, will that that wood 
we go back to each of those uh, and then uh, uh, and then this is related to the second one here of uh, uh, stable obstructions either is there stable natural key pieces or in many cases maybe maybe it's a combination of you engineer a few structures as well as putting in uh, the loose stuff. Uh, so screening tool uh, inputs, uh, won't have to go through all these with you, but it, these are a list of things that go into the, uh, your analysis um, and, uh, and figuring out whether or not uh, it's appropriate to, to be putting in this wood. And here's a screenshot of uh, part of the spreadsheet tool. Uh, where it will come back and basically tell you, um, hey, you got a low risk site, go for it. It, it. Again, as long as you think it's going to meet your goals, uh, to uh, red, like, hey, you've got to either engineer this or, or, or work with someone who can uh, help you with that design. Uh, so, again, just some of the different input criteria. Uh, uh, that goes into that, that tool. And uh, so these are familiar from uh, this morning's talk too on uh, uh, different kinds of channel cross sections. Uh, here's an example of the out here of an incised channel with a, maybe an inset floodplain where it's had time to widen and start to readjust the floodplain where compared to a uh, small, uh, say, Undisturbed system for uh, in an undefined illegal beach. Uh, but knowing what, you know, again, what kind of flows are you going to get is going to come back to be a factor in that wood selection uh, and what kind of wood you want to put into that. Um, and we go into uh, uh, some of the some basic hydraulics. And, and looking at the, the system from what your formative discharge is, uh, you know, and so so as Doc explained, there's bang full. So technically, say say you have a uh, incised system like this, um, you know, your bank full, your current bank full is going to be where that inset plug plane is. This this is going to be another bank full. It's it, you know, but it may be a bank full that only gets. Uh, indicated at a, a hundred year event or something because of the incision. Uh, so uh, figuring out what your your usually when we do more fossils for a formative discharge is is the, the the discharge that starts to mobilize your bed material. Uh, so what's moving down the system, uh, and uh, and then figuring out what kind of sediment mobility you have. In that system, based on that, the flow condition, uh, and then you need stream power or stream power, um, which is basically just a, your discharge times slope, and then um, when you a unit stream power, you're just dividing that by width to get uh, a, a, a more of a, a term that maybe people to use to compare. Probably this is useful. I mean, there are whole sets of set of transport equations based on stream power, but uh, one, one thing that's really useful with unit stream power is when you're characterizing historic disturbance and whether this has changed uh, uh, significantly through time uh, with the concentration of flow in the channel. Uh, so different kinds of uh, configurations um, of wood, uh, and what, what you might expect. And again, from a fishery standpoint, we want to engage with the water, right? So that's a, a really important because sometimes your roots would, would just end up up on your uh, your flood plane after being flow. Um, so back to uh, root wads. They're uh, again really if you want to start putting key pieces in the, the river face, I think. Uh, Imperative to at least consider how important that root water is going to be. Um, and, um, and so that's going to link back to your, 
your channel geometry and your flow conditions. Uh, and, uh, what, and then again, the watts are usually a wide variety of shapes. So we, we discussed that in uh, uh, in the document on uh, when when you're going to need to do that. So um, anyway, it's like I used to just summarize in the document some of the things we talked about earlier on looking at centroids of your your system and then. Uh, uh, you know, one option might be if you can pre bury your st structure, can that make a difference? And so that's definitely an option, whether it's pre buried and part of it is to the bank or whether it's stayed in the, the stream. And then uh, bed and bank material, um, which again is important, you know, when we start to look at, well, when is that mobile? When did the bed mobilize? Because if you could show that your piece of wood is stable at a flow that's starting to mobilize your sediment, that means it's, there's a good chance for the wood to dig itself in and give you uh, that benefit. Uh, but if you look at your wood is going to be mobile before that bed, uh, bed load initiation, then it is likely to uh, not stay very long. So, um, guys, again, you got to. What are your what's your system currently? You know, is it if you have a straight or, or seamless channel? Do you have existing obstructions uh, in the channel? Do you have uh, riparian trees that can tangle things, tangle wood and uh, or catch wood? Um, and then uh, feasibility rating. Uh, this is just summarizing what I mentioned earlier on. Uh, you know, if you low risk is following the guidance, uh, you know, go ahead and proceed. Uh, and then as that risk increases, you're just bringing in the expertise um, needed to, to, to move that uh, forward. And here's an example of mine from the other uh, on the North Fort Canaway, uh, uh, 250 pieces of wood installed here in 2000. And 20, uh, and then much of it had moved. Um, uh, um, uh, and I, I, I don't know if I should talk about it, I'm not sure. It, it wasn't very long uh, before it, I mean, it moved. And then the first bankful event was in 2023, and most of the wood had transported out of the beach. So um, maybe the wood was doing some good elsewhere, but it was an investment. Here's an example of an investment, and um, it, you may not, if, if your goals were uh, to change things, it wasn't successful. Uh, uh, so, again, understanding what's going to happen in wood is, uh, is pretty important. Uh, so here, in this case, stream power exceeded the Niagara Woods ability, uh, and uh, the, the the case was this. Uh, the, uh, there was a period where the, like, the admiration was putting in a lot of this wood without a lot of uh, analysis, which kind of spawned this this development of these guys. Uh, here is an uh, example where we've got a much more uh, we've got wood placements and that are, are more, being more effective in the uh, helping transform that channel. You know, when when wood is stable and it starts to do things like split flow, you're distributing that stream power and energy more effectively, which then is uh, increasing the probability of wood being retained. So, um, so these things are all linked uh, and understanding how that's going to happen. And because if, if it just blows out, then um, you're not going to get and have that uh, effect of dissipating energy in the future. And then one of my one thing, all even when you are doing engineer log jams, you should be integrating a lot of loose wood. It's really important, I would argue. And uh, with the and you know, with the engineer log jam, we put what we call rack wood, which is all unanchored. 
wood, there's nothing holding it uh, directly. There's no, you know, we're not cabling or chaining or, or ballasting it. Um, I usually go deep. So, like with any large, any engineer logic, I'm going to rip it kind of like an iceberg. It should be somewhat like an iceberg. They're they're going much deeper than you would see these boats. And it's important that that loose wind go down to what you expect would be your scour depth uh, in front of your structure. And um, and even though even the most stable engineer logic I'm still is deformable because natural wood will accumulate some of that wood will. Um, as the river changes direction and angle, then its incident angle, some of that wood will slough off. Uh, and uh, but uh, I just really strongly uh, loose wood is part of this. That that whole pile of rack material affects where the scour hole is. So you really don't want your scour to get underneath where your piles, are, you know, which is how what happened. The more the more rack material you have, the more you're pushing that scour away from the core of your structure, which is uh, is going to be really important. The scour is typically just like with traditional structures, whether bridge beers, riprap, scour is the typical failure mechanism for a lot of engine, river engineering structures. Uh, so then we'll kind of conclude with just hydraulic modeling, uh, which we're constantly learning. Um, um, so as Dawson said too, it's uh, uh, you're all about in with your model modeling. The outputs are all going to be relative to inputs, um, poor quality input and poor quality output. Uh, so getting your 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 surface right is going to be another really important thing. And then with uh, a two D model, if your mesh, uh, you can see the mesh size. <coughs> Much bigger where we don't have uh, obstructions or wood, and that with that mesh gets much finer around the wood. And that um, that could be if, because each each node or each cell you're assigning a roughness element, so you can start to then change your uh, where roughness values to be more reflective of uh, your your obstruction. And again, it depends what that obstruction is. It's just a solid log. Um, or is it a more complex porous structure? Um, so typically your mesh is uh, it's going to take a few iterations to uh, develop this. Uh, so uh, uh, so as we raise the roughness values in our mesh, you know we're going to see an influence on water surface elevation. This uh, wood will. You know, as a general rule, wood will raise water elevations if you're not changing something else. Um, uh, is it uh, uh, appropriate for highly porous loose wood? It's quick um, to apply to large areas and easy to do as I said in just. Uh, and then um, uh, your roughness value is going to usually affect your flow vectors very much um, if you deflect. The effect, yeah. other than the magnitude of them, sometimes. Um, and then it's not appropriate for densely packed or backfill DLGA and create uh, a feedback loop with shear stress outputs, um, creates a uh, uh, infinitely tied column of roughness. Uh, you know, so that, again, in this 2D, that's something to keep in mind. And that, that roughness value is. is um, uh, usually not depth uh, dependent, and then um, you you still need to do a sensitivity analysis, you know, with, with this. So, just some examples of uh, uh, 2D results. Uh, uh, you know, they're really rarely do we are doing, you know, at least in larger channels. Uh, one need anymore just since the ease of doing 2D models and increase so much in the processing time. That decrease. So solid obstruction and raised roughness. Again, the thick areas where it influences. Um, and then uh, this is a more appropriate for tightly packed backfill DLJs. Um, uh, it was the overtop that and top elevations can be manipulated. So that's one thing we've been doing more recently is 
It's purposely designed ELJ structures that are regularly overtopped, uh, that are right, you know, at that bank full elevation. I think for some period there was designs that were you know, just to get added uh, um, surcharge behind the structure. But we found, especially when you use files or posts, you don't need that. You don't need that uh, surcharge of the big pile of sediment as much. Um, so impact of this particular approach is that it can be overly conservative for poor structures, um, and uh, it can be easily calculated can double the impact, um, and then uh, more labor intensive than roughness of the changes. Uh, and here's just examples where you. Uh, again, we've got different roughness uh, uh, assignments to, to have actually in different parts of the structure, but just showing where you may modify the mesh to show a solid here. Um, so typically, we'll, with, when we have this kind of arrangement in the mesh, we'll have a lot of roughness, high roughness values up front to show that there is water there. But but much slower because of that that roughness to kind of let like that order structure um, some output there. Uh, you can see again the flow overtopping these these particular structures. Okay, so course obstruction and raised roughness. Uh, go back through uh, its effects, um, and this is so when you do this, it's the most accurate. The real world is what we found. Um, and a few things to keep in mind that with right turbidity and uh, uh, or turbulence really, and then um, the, uh, it can create velocity hot spots, um, more labor intensive, um, and it's the least established practice. So, there are uh, just some uh, things again to keep in mind with the different approaches. Um, and here's an example of that for construction in a big process. So that's great. It's like creating several solids. Yeah. Closer together. Yeah. Not all. Yeah, exactly. And here's another one uh, where we've got a porous obstruction and then uh, roughness. And then what we've got. Uh, some examples of where we've been recently doing about smaller systems is we uh we just been doing a bunch of wood, um, getting wood back into uh, some insights channel. So, one one where we just did a bunch of shale creek, um, and then it's a clear water, we did a tributary of clear water in the peninsula, and uh, we did their rock ballasted structures, they're helicopter plates, so it's basically wood with. Dropping a collar on it. Uh, and there, in this case, we intentionally were trying to obstruct most of the channel with these, these structures. So they're of course, um, uh, but it, very similar to this. Um, and we've the, some of these sites we've been putting them in are bedrock. Um, and we found that there's lots of sediment transport because or supply because they've We've seen just an immediate, just after a single flood, of course, high flow, we've seen immediate changes in the channel with sediment accumulation. Uh, and one cool thing we're also seeing with some of these structures is unlike just a traditional long leader, when you, you have a structure where you've got, say, um, maybe some rack bundles um, up front, but then you've got some key pieces in the back, which is how little some of these helicopter signs are done. So, so that we ballast those key pieces, um, and then um, and then they're what they're, they're what's holding in place the rack material. But all the roughness. So when water overtops the the front, there's roughness on the downstream side, and that's that's actually been really effective at reducing scour, plunging scour, and and getting uh, um, actual even sediment accumulation in the downstream where you didn't typically have to worry about uh, uh, if it's you know more of a traditional structure than undermining the structure um, uh, because it, it, there's nothing to break up that flow. Um, so so 
uh, back to the, you know, what should the roughness be? Well, how far is this your DLJ? Um, how high is it relative to more surface? Uh, and uh, are computing turbulence and what uh, parts of the DLJ are interacting with low? So, um, you know, constantly learning and improving this. Uh, Julia put, uh, have put a bunch of these slides together. Um, and then, um, you know, how does the mesh manifest? I mean, how does it manifest in the mesh? You know, so knowing where to draw your break lines um, and uh, how the computations disperse across the mesh and, and is turbulence modeled explicitly. So it's not included in the typical equation sets um, for either Enterprise or for Flow 2D, uh, but it is in SRHD. So these are probably the three most common models that are out there that um, we're regularly using. Um, and I think that's it. Um, so there's lots. Uh, and love to talk to people about more. And you can sure you guys have some questions. Have you guys used the national LW equals in Techgrass right now? Is that we just started using it. Yeah, I actually helped with the core when they were developing that and the uh, Davis lab. And uh, so we're just starting to, to do that. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, as you know, it's pretty new. Yeah, it's hard to put multiple pieces together. Yeah. And you put one isolated piece together. Yeah, I think that's one of the kinks that we'll have to engage. Yeah, it, things are evolving quickly, and it's just amazing how much has changed with the way of life in my career of 30 years just to be, you know, the, the amount of publications that are coming out. It's nice to see it's a soft tool of the narrative. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't used it yet, but does it have a, a setting to manipulate porosity at all, or is it just a solid object? It's a solid object. Yeah, it looks like a T. Okay. Yeah, it just, yeah, it's always set the really blood size and the whole size. Okay. Like, does it, does it attach to your, your terrain so it modifies your actual terrain or how does that function? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I got a question okay. um, related to uh, you were talking about placing large wood, loose large wood and the potential for it to sink down into your bed. What if you have a situation where you're doing a, an approach, more like a, a stage zero type of approach right. or channel filling where you're taking floodplain material, putting it into your channel? Do you have any recommendations on burying that material or putting it on the surface? What do you find looking at there? Uh, I, in like the low risk setting where you're right. that flow. I would strongly, I, 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 I would strongly do at least partially buried at your wood. Uh, I think uh, that's a whole other area of the rapidly developing where I think uh, some, some, people, some good ideas got out of the way of, of in front of the science and engineering. Uh, but you know the, the, the key thing there is, is reducing that stream power and by filling the channel and getting much shallower, wider dispersion of your flow. And uh, so the ones I, I took a tour of some of the down in Oregon last year. Uh, and you know, I think it's a combination of, of stuff where they put stuff on the surface. And, and then I know uh, I work with one of the contractors that does a bunch, has done a bunch of that. And they're a really great contractor that has done had enough experience with wood that they they knew to go back and bury parts of it. But uh, uh, but yeah, I mean there's in understanding what's going to happen because if your channel was incised uh, before, and of course you've got a downstream boundary, uh, what's going to prevent a head cut from just floating its way back up? And so, so some of the early projects you're starting to see that. Is you know that the response uh, 
And, and whenever you put in something that obstructs flow, flow will find a way around it. Um, so that's one of the other areas I think that's really fascinating is it is um, like in small channels, if you're obstructing flow and you, you're going to expect some back erosion, well, that's where you knowing what your riparian conditions are like, like because what we're like on shale green, we saw that exact thing happen where banks started to road and trees came down, but then because there was the obstruct stable obstruction of the ship, those trees that normally would have just been washed downstream were sticking around and just enlarging this the structure. Uh, and in big rivers, we found uh, you know it's an array or, or field of ELJs that you really need to, to consider it's, it, it, and, uh, and understanding how close to make those is super important because you, you make them space them close to your, your kind of natural or un, uh, un, unobstructed rivers bankful, then you're, what you're going to get is a, a bankful channel that just goes right in between your ELJs and, and not a lot of uh, effect of your ELJs. So, so you've got to get them close enough that, that it, it, you're really constricting. What I, my general rule is you want to at least 30% of your bankful uh, would be the, uh, to, to, you know, Really trimming it down because again, you're, you're going to get flow around those structures. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you may remind me of that. Is there so what's the silver bullet for the Is there one for you? know, you're creating possible conditions where you can put on that area. Um, I mean, I think that. Channels is definitely my passion. And we've, we've been addressing it in a bunch of debates from, from channels that were once what we call a zero order channel, where basically it was all originally under natural conditions, it would have been a subsurface flow, hyperbian flow only, with very rare surface flow we've been expressing. But because of urbanization or whatever, you've seen the channel network move upstream. And we've done some structured, some work and some of those that has been working really well of, of really just loading up the channel with wood. Again, uh, it, it brings up a philosophic and, and real world question of, well, uh, if your channel is propagated upstream, that fish don't come, come along with it because again, you're in this case, you're restoring a, a subsurface channel which can really have, we know now more this, and I think there's great combination of uh, uh, hyperbaric benefits of, of wood, um, including cleaning, you know, this one project, uh, I think a bunch of other scientists did that in the dirt breeding moments in the city of Seattle. I think 1,200 petrochemical pollutants uh, uh, were uh, cities. There was a sense. Reduction uh, and then because of the hydrogen flow. Uh, and so, uh, getting off back on excision, I, you know, uh, the silver bullet is getting the roughness back. I mean, even if you just use rock, I mean, just stop, stop the incision, you know, because. because the more incisors, the more uh, it becomes a flume. For the when it gets like subsurface rock. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not a point you're creating one of your side channels. Yeah. But I think, think again, it, it, you know, using a combination of rock and wood uh, is what we're seeing is very, very effective. So that's and they're on the surface. Um, oh. Both. Um, Depending like these helicopter projects where we rock collars, it's really remarkable how quickly the rock collars just get buried. Um, and so they become part of the subsurface, but they weren't initially. Um, and then, uh, you know, so in eastern Washington, uh, some of the fun name is a lot more restrictive is capable and chain and stuff like that. So you've got to be a little more. It gets a little more complicated when you, uh, I think there's still maybe to do it. Um, and then if you do put wood in, 
you need to just make it complex, not yeah, because sing along weird, you know, like like from the 80s, just didn't perform very well. They either undermine because of the plan pool or the head cut, but again, getting more complex, just getting a complex array of wood is a very effective uh, way to treat this issue. Uh, so you know it's 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 a challenge because if you say you don't use rock, you, you're gonna probably have to do things like dig a trench into your bank, delay that log, and, and then extend it out, um, which could you know present its own challenges more, more disturbance, more cost. Uh, you have to get the heavy equipment in there and so on. Yeah, so if uh, anybody has questions or would like the, the anchor tool or more about the publications, just uh, yeah, write me uh, or text me or call. And, uh, um, and we do have on our, our website, we've got an open source page uh, that's got a bunch of publications there. I've, I've got a, quite a library uh, of stuff. Uh, on some of these topics, and if you all are interested in it. Is it okay to share this PowerPoint as a PDF? Oh, sure. Right? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, let's, let's give Tim a big.